The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful uh, fall day. Now it is my honor to welcome back uh, our, our speaker, uh, Tom Pendergrass, Chairman and CEO of the Metropolitan Transport Transportation Authority. Tom was appointed to his position in June of 2013 after serving as president for New York City Transit since 2009. He has spent his entire career in the public transportation world and previously ran Vancouver's Transit Link System. He also held a post at the US DOT and the Chicago Transit Authority. In nearly two years since Tom has been at the helm of the MTA, the agency has been busier than ever. Last summer, the MTA averted a potential crippling Long Island strike, railroad strike, approved a new contract for its 34,000 union employees, and performed extensive tunnel work on major train lines following the damage uh, after Hurricane Sandy. Tom has continued to uh, move important capital projects forward, including the east side access and the Second Avenue subway line, which I am told will be completed uh, by December of 2016. It will be a real game changer for not just the east side of Manhattan, but for all of New York. There's no doubt that the MTA is the lifeblood of our city. It keeps New York moving and serves the millions of workers, residents, and tourists who increasingly want to get to places much further afield from midtown Manhattan. Service to the growing outer boroughs has never been more important, and Tom has kept the trains running quite literally. Tom, we're happy to welcome you back uh, and to hear more about your capital plan. Uh, and uh, how to fund this important uh, endeavor. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming MTA Chairman Tom Pendergrass. Good morning, everyone. There's two times of the year we love running transit systems. That's the spring and the fall, and that's in large part due to the weather, and we've really had a great fall so far. I've been on the job more than a year. I've been confirmed a little bit more than a year. And I've talked to a number of the previous chairmen of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And to a person, they all said without me asking them that while the chairman has a number of formidable challenges, probably the most formidable one is getting the next capital program. Because since 1982, we have had a series of five-year capital programs that breathed, li bre breathed life back into this system, which is so vital to New York, and has enabled us to spend over $100 billion in, in doing that. And we're now embarking on the next capital program, which is 15 through 19. Um, these investments started out as ones that were focused on state of good repair. Because for those of you who are old enough to remember who rode the system and how decrepit it was in 1982, not due to any action on part of anyone, just a fiscal dire uh, straits that New York City was in in the 70s. Uh, we had derailments, we had, uh, you know, uh, car fires, we had graffiti throughout the entire system, and the business community said enough is enough, we need to do something to change it. And then over a period of programs, we morphed into, beyond state of good repair, what we could do to actually improve the quality and level of service we provide through capital investments, and even more recently, restore what had been the landmark of the growth of New York City in the first part of the 20th century, which was the rapid growth of the two private sector operations, the Interborough Rapid Transit and the Brooklyn Rapid Transit, which then became the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit, and the independent system built by the city. But the growth of New York City into what it is today would not have occurred had it not been for its transit system. And so the importance of making sure that we keep that network vital is strong. And it's something that I make sure, I'm making sure that I'm endorsing very heavily. There are times I think that we have not been as aggressive as we maybe could have been, and this is not taking a knock at anyone in terms of reminding them of how important the MTA system is to the region. You know, we carry 8.7 million people a day. We run 8,000 subway trains and over 1,500 commuter rail trains, and we make up the overwhelming majority of the public transit that is carried in the country. In terms of how we stack up against other cities, we're up there in the top 10 as well, if not top five. And it's especially important 
that we keep in mind the relationship that public transportation has to a thriving city that is probably the leading economic city in the world. We've got an economy of some $1.4 trillion, second only to Japan, to, to Tokyo, and I think it's important that we, we keep that in mind. While one can say they carry a lot of customers like we do across the world, run a lot of trains like we do across the world, where we stand out as different from anyone else are the 468 subway stations and 245 suburban commuter rail stations. And many systems do not have anywhere near that number of stations. If you take a look at the rest of the transit industry in the United States, there are only some 500 transit stations. In the rest of the United States, we have 468. Now, on one hand, somebody's going to say size doesn't matter. It, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to be big? But I'll tell you what it means to be big. On one hand, it's a large infrastructure that needs to be maintained. And there's a cost associated with it. And we could take a decision to say we could actually offload some of those costs by closing some of those stations. But for the elected officials and their constituents and our customers who depend on those stations, that's a null alternative. The advantage of 468 stations is that 71% of New York City's population live within a half mile of a station. Now in transit planning geekism, three eighths to a half mile is about what people will walk to get to a subway station. So we have probably the largest footprint in terms of the ability to have people utilize the system. On the commuter rail network, 71%, 73% of Long Island Railroad customers and 51% of Metro North customers live within two miles of a station. How many of those customers or commuters come by way of a car and park? But if you go to other city, cities and transport systems in the United States, their drive to their station is far greater. So we have an asset that we have a responsibility to maintain that's rather large that provides tremendous public utility to the region and its growth, and has been its growth. We have a system that's 24-7. There was a period of time when the system, the, the, the globe got down to around three systems that were 24 hours, seven days a week, and we were looking to have closures on weekends at nights to do maintenance. Now people are following our example. Even London is trying to look to see to have 24-7 service on Saturday and Sunday because of the impact it has on the economy. We have a flat fare on the subway system, which provides, it's a great equalizer across economic strata. We have express and local tracks for the same fare. No other system has that. No other system in the world has four track right of ways. And what that gives you is an ability, if you're a customer, is for a very attractive fare, having two levels of service, one express and one local. If you're a business looking to attract employees to your company, or you're somebody who wants to work in the region and work at a company in the region, you have the ability to not only set your sights on what your fare is going to be on the subway system, but what your travel time will be. Because the ability to have express and local tracks means that you have a reach far greater in distance to those residents that you may want to be part of your business as an employee or as a customer. And that's something we don't really do a good job of selling and telling people. There's a cost associated with four track right of ways. There's a cost associated with express and local service, but I think the benefits far outweigh the costs. We're an entity that has very long roots. The subway system is actually one of the younger because Long Island Railroad was the Pennsylvania and Metro North was the uh, uh, New York Central and they go back even farther. But those assets bring ages and conditions with them that require upkeep. From a standpoint of sustainability, and for those, I lived in a short period of time in Vancouver, pristine environment, beautiful area, uh, and people could say that, you know, from a sustainability standpoint, one of the best places in the earth to live. But if you measure sustainability by the size of the carbon footprint that the people who live in the region take, we lead the pack because of the public transport system and because of the fact that people are not fully dependent on cars. There's people in this region that are, that are I'll be the first to say that, but the overwhelming majority of people can and do use and take access of the MTA system. It allows employees to make decisions that are critical work-life balance decisions. 
Traditionally, early on in someone's life, when they first get married, they may not be able to afford a house very close to where they work. But this system and its reach enables people to buy housing and live in other parts of the region where the housing is more affordable to them. Or they don't want to live in an urban lifestyle, or other people do want to live in an urban lifestyle. That provides something. The MTA network provides something in way of choice that other parts of the, of the country do not have. The last item is also one that many of our uh, associates around the world are envious of. And it's something that I think New Yorkers probably in ignorance take for granted. But it's what we call interoperability. If you go to a system like London, with the exception of one part of the system, where a number of the trains and a number of the lines actually share the circle line in downtown London, the rest of the deep tube lines, which are deep 140 feet down, are standalone elements of their system. And when they go out of service due to some emergency or some problem, the people have to resort to a bus system to get to work. If we have a problem in the east side IRT, the Lexington Avenue line, we can easily and do easily reroute trains over the west side, Broadway, 6th Avenue, 8th Avenue. So we can get people within blocks of their destination downtown. Yes, it'll be a longer trip. Instead of a 20, 25 minute trip, it may be 40, but it's not half a day, it's not two hours, it's not three hours. And there's a cost associated with that interoperability, but once again, as I said earlier, there's a benefit that I think far exceeds the cost. Our current program, total of some $32 billion, and the reason why it's $32 billion, because it's got the 26 to 27 billion that we've got from the uh, creation of the 10 through 14 program through the, the method of going through the state legislature and getting those funds, but laid on top of it, we've got the funds that come, are coming our way as a result of Superstorm Sandy. The single largest event that has caused as much impact to the system in its 100 year history. When the original IRT was built, the engineers were marvelous. They really, if you ever take a look at a railroad in the Midwest of the United States, and you may be, be somewhere where it's relatively flat, and you'll notice the railroad is up on some kind of elevated embankment or ballast. And what you'll find is they've designed that to the 100 year flood level for that area, plus six inches. <laughs> because they want to make sure they minimize their cost, but they maximize their investment. And when the original IRT uh, engineers designed what were the first contracts and what they thought the water levels of New York Bay were, which are about 10 inches to 11 inches lower than what they are now, it's lasted us well for 100 years. And with the exception of this one singular event, we've had tunnels of flood before, we've had sections of the system flood before, but we've never seen the level of havoc that was wreaked upon, wreaked upon us as Superstorm Sandy was. But it's now time to actually pause and make sure that as we move forward and as we renew the system under state of good repair, we design to a higher standard. And the current program is doing that in what we call fix and fortify. We're also continuing the progress in the current program on what we call the mega projects. We expect Fulton Center to open later this year, 7 West early next year, and East Side Access, very, very difficult project, probably more difficult than we anticipated when we first started it some 15, 18 years ago, with a completion date of 2022, which will provide access for people from Long Island to Midtown at 42nd Street and Grand Central, and also provide for additional capacity for Metro North customers for what we call Penn Station access because as the development grows on the west side, we're gonna have a need for people to be able to not only get from the outer lying locations to those new areas, especially if Midtown East is rezoned, but for people in those areas to go other places in the region. Metro North has been extremely successful in terms of reverse peak commute, getting people up to White Plains and Stamford, and that helps the region grow. And we also need to continue what we've already started in terms of this program, which is the countdown clocks, which is the ability for people to see on the numbered lines of the system the actual minutes and seconds when the next train will arrive. For those of you that started riding transit as far back as when I did, I never even dreamed of a day of having countdown clocks. New systems had them, but old systems don't. But for the new customers on our system, that what we call the millennials, it's not an enhancement, it's an expectation. And we're gonna to continue to do those in the current program. Bus time, the ability for you to use a mobile electronic device and find out 
when the next bus will get there or how far away it is. Uh, you've all been subject to what we call bus punching, where you wait for, they say the bus is on a six minute headway, you've waited 20, you see nothing, and you see five buses come in a row. And bus time has given people the ability to decide when they go to the bus stop or once when they get there, what their level of frustration is. We also don't mind they have a, a mobile electronic device to keep them, keep them uh, uh, busy as they're waiting for the bus to come, and that will continue. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the program that the board approved at the September, at its September board meeting, and we submitted to the Capital Program Review Board. The legislative process that we need to go through is one which requires our board to approve a plan by category. Categories are track, infrastructure, stations, signals, that type, and a specific line item associated within that category for the project's scope and budgeted. And then we submit that to the Capital Program Review Board. It's made up of a representative from the Senate, the Assembly, New York City, and New York State DOT, and any one of those parties has the right to veto the program. It's not a simple plurality. Any one of those parties have a right to veto it. So it's a process we go through in terms of defining what the scope of the program is, defining what its shape and size is, and as balanced a way as we can to accommodate the growing needs of the region at large, and do so in a way where at the end of the day we get it funded. And so that needed to be submitted October 1st, and it was, and then the dialogue starts. Because historically, not a single program got turned back approved and we went forward. There was a dialogue with respect to scope, which projects are in, which projects are, are out, what the priorities are, and how we're gonna fund it. And that's where we stand today. Now there are times I like to, because when you start to talk about billions of dollars, there are a lot of people that wince and say, how are we gonna pay for that? The size of the MTA asset if you add up all of the assets, New York City Transit, Subway and Bus, Paratransit, Metro North, Long Island Railroad, and Bridges and Tunnels, and I'll come back to Bridges and Tunnels in a minute, is some $965 billion, rounded to a trillion. A billion is a thousand million, a trillion is a thousand billion. That's the size of the asset. If you would take a look at the average lifespan of any one of the categories I mentioned, signals, track, communications, infrastructure, stations, average lifespan of 40 years, some are less, some are more, you should be spending about $8 billion a year for state of good repair. So that would be $40 billion in a five-year program. Before you talk about enhancement and before you talk about expansion. And if you go back and look at the archives and you've seen some of the pictures and you see some of the initial construction of contract one, which was the construction of the subway from Brooklyn Bridge to 42nd Street across to the west side and then up to a yard at 149th Street, um, there were sections where the lines were being built. Also later in the 30s when the Queens Boulevard line was being built by the independent by the city where construction is going on and there is no housing like you see today because the housing followed the transportation. And we need to be able to, I'm going beyond the issue of state of good repair, that $8 billion number, I'm going to the issue of enhancement and expansion. New York City is gonna see a million more residents by 2035. The region is gonna see an additional million more people by 2035, that's two million. What is already the largest city uh, in, in the country. So we need to be able to appropriately expand the system to accommodate that need. We talk about Second Avenue as if it's an expansion, but the original bond issue for Second Avenue was in the 1930s. And only now we're getting to see the first phase of it completed in December of 2016. If that doesn't get completed, it will get completed. The number one most crowded line in the country is the Lexington Avenue line. For those of you that ride it every day, I don't need to make that statement to you. The second most crowded line in the country is the Queens Boulevard line. And we need to be able to add capacity and offload some of that ridership on the Lexington Avenue line if we want Manhattan to continue to grow and expand and remain the number one economic center in the world. We also need to expand capacity by new technology. And I'll talk about that in the new program. 
That's basically with new signals that not only provide enhanced safety, but additional ability to run more trains. So we're at a place where state of good repair, as important as it is, as it is needs to be complemented or added to by enhancing a system and expanding it. What you'll see in the 15 through 19 program is positive train control for both commuter railroads. We need to have a signal system in place, communication-based train control for New York City Transit and positive train control for the two commuter railroads that ensure the safe operation of trains. It's a requirement. It's something we're knowingly, willingly do, and that's one of the highest profile elements in the next program. CBT also provides an ability for us, the Transit Authority, to run more trains per hour so we can get additional customers in a given rush hour on a given line. Got to replace 86 miles of track. That's pretty straightforward. We need to do things to also improve the environment of our stations. If you've had the benefit of riding in other systems that were built at a, at a you know, much uh, later period of time than ours were, you have some level of climate control. I would never say air conditioning, but some love it, level of climate control. When we air conditioned the trains, we increased the ambient temperature in the subway some 10 to 12 degrees, and we need to do things to improve the environment. I'm not promising climate control, but I am promising making sure we make sure those, those stations are safe. And we're not saying closing stations. We want 468 or more stations as we expand the system. In terms of enhancement, we want to accelerate as fast as possible the uh, provision of countdown clocks on the B division. Won't be exactly the same format that you see on the numbered lines, but it will be similar to, so you won't have to be standing looking over the platform edge. We want to implement new fare technology. As novel as the fare card was, it's 20 years old. It needs to be replaced, and it's not an easy and convenient way for you to buy purchase fare media. Not only if you're just riding one element of our system, but if you're riding two or three elements of our system. You should have the ability to do what you do in, in other walks of life where you go to a mobile electronic device and buy your fair media. And it's as seamless a process as possible across not only our network, but the other networks in the region, whether they be the Port Authority or New Jersey Transit. We need to complete Long Island Railroad's double track and expand the amount of select bus service. It's a simplified version of bus rapid transit. We do not have the money, the time, or the patience to be able to wait for rail lines to be built. The way this system was designed at the turn of the 19th to the 20th centuries was very manually intensive. You had token booth clerks, you had station agents, you had a conductor for every two cars of the train. Why? Because you couldn't multiply control doors across an entire train. So if you see pictures and you're old enough, the conductor stood between the cars, one foot on one car, one foot in the other car, two handles of controls, and he, they were mostly he's at that time, opening and closing doors. The system was designed very manually intensive. And now what we've been trying to do is use that labor in other ways and reduce the number of token booth clerks but put them in other duties. But we need to provide a means for people to be able to access a third party, whether they be at the station or someplace else, if they need information or if there's a police, a fire, or security emergency. And that's the blue help points that we have installed on the platforms we need to get them throughout the rest of the system. One of the things we've been criticized for, and rightfully so, I'll start in, start in descending order of priority, meaning the highest priority first and then lower the less. Mega projects are not the core competency of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And I'm not so sure they should ever be the core competency. To build a multi-billion dollar project that's needed, east side access, seven west, uh, Fulton Street, Fulton Street's a little different because it's a part of the system, but 7 West and East Side Access, you can actually do a lot of the construction and the only place you touch the system is where you marry up to it. And we need to do more aggressively design build, PPP, public-private partnerships. There's a lot of resistance within the MTA family and some of its employees to do that because they've never done it before, but in actual fact, the construction of the original subway was a public-private partnership. August Belmont brought the finance the city had the charter, and William Barclay Parsons was the chief engineer, because the city didn't have the core competency to build the first subway system. And if we need to do more mega projects, we need to do it more efficiently and effectively, transfer that risk to the private sector, who are more geared to be able to accept that risk and deliver a project on time within budget, because it's not necessarily our core competency. When you go into somebody's pocket and ask for additional money, 
They're going to be reluctant to give it to you. They may even fight you. They may even try to cut your hand off. But if you get it out of their pocket, you better deliver on what you've said you're going to deliver on. So the other thing we need to do, and we've made this offer before, and I'll put the challenge on my own organization, because maybe we're the ones that have failed. The contractors and consultants that support us in the carrying out of these multi-billion dollar capital programs know of better and more effective and efficient ways to get that work done. In some cases, it's procurement regulation that needs to be changed. I'll go up to Albany and have that dialogue to get it changed. In other ways, it's, it's a willingness to pass off some of the risk and take away some of the control on our side and end up with a better product at cheaper cost. And I'm going to commit that as we sell this capital program and we get closure on it, there will be that discussion with the contract and the consulting community to deal with those. We've made those promises in the past, and for whatever reason we haven't been able to get to a different place, I'm just saying now we need to get to a different place. Um, we're also going to continue to go to other people to be able to look where they can bring their knowledge and resources into the system. We have a contract with Transit Wireless to bring connectivity into some of our stations. We have enough trouble doing what we need to do to run the 8,000 trains a day we run and see the hundreds of thousands of people we see at station complexes. And if we can use the core competencies, I'm using Transit Wireless as one example. There's others, and I may not mention them, but there's not out of uh, deliberate on my part not to mention them, where we can tap their knowledge and experience and we can tap their ability to bring resources, whether they be financial or the personnel to do the work to improve that environment. Because people do want to stay connected, people do want to stay in touch, and it also fills up idle time. And there's a lot of idle time sometimes waiting for a train or waiting for a bus. The last thing I want to talk about, and I'll just talk about it in general, is what I've tried to focus on today is the importance of the program. It is probably the most important thing that a chairman has to do, and it's a, it's a task that just needs to be redone on a continual basis and every five years when we get a plan. I want to underscore the importance of what the MTA network does for the region as a whole. And I've had people come in and tell me, people that worked at a federal level, in the federal government, setting transportation policy, and they're amazed at what the asset is here. I'm going to make a number of comments. One of, it, one of it is, is that it, it may be underappreciated, but it's probably not, but you need to do a better job of selling the people as to how important it is to the region and what benefits you have that other regions don't. The importance of maintaining the asset, but the thing that really struck home was, if you live in a metropolitan area where there were no transportation system and you have to make large capital investments to get one and you don't, that's a problem. But if you have one, and you have an asset that's second to none, and you don't maintain it, you don't keep it in good working order, and you end up losing that asset, that's unconscionable. And that's the position I take as MTA chairman, is that one that I and my other agency heads can't let happen. It's got to get beyond state of good repair, it's got to get to enhancement, it's got to get to expansion. I need your collective help in doing that. I've worked in the MTA the majority of my career. I've come back to it after being away. And the other experiences were good, but I will tell you what New York has, outside of the, the robustness of its transportation network, which is second to none, it has a capacity and a will to do what needs to be done to get funding for projects and for infrastructure. The day that we wait solely for Washington and other third parties, when the state and the city can control its own destiny, is something that I need your collective support for and I'm confident I'll get. Thank you very much.